Thank you. Thank you, Michiko. I will try to keep a section in 60 minutes, as uh, the program says. So thank you so much. Uh, so we are now going on talking about policy, and we have uh, one speaker and two discussants. I will introduce uh, all of them, and then I will give them uh, uh, the floor. So the speaker is Professor Andre Tosi Furtado. Uh, he's from the Department of Scientific and Technological Policy um, at the University of Campania. And then we will have two discussants, Amir Lebdui, uh, who is a development economist and a lecturer in the political economy of, develop in political economy of development at SOAS uh, in London. And finally, Johnson Okori, uh, um, who is a research officer at the National Center for Technology Man Management. So please, Andre Furtado, the floor is yours, uh, 15 min minutes if it's possible. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, for Michiko and for you, and for everyone who is assisting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to the GlobalX community. I have prepared some uh, slides here, and I will, I will try to talk in 50 minutes, trying to, to attend to, the, to what is required. So... Uh, I think, are you seeing my slides now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good, it's okay. Okay, so uh, so I, I will try to talk in, in this few minutes about uh, policy methods and indicators. My, my presentation will focus mainly on indicators is the field where I'm working on, but I will talk a little bit about policy uh, and methods. I think many of the things that I will say have been said before, but many of you, so uh, I'm not uh, going to create uh, new things, but uh, uh, I will say uh, like a general background that uh, in, the, in the South, or, in developing countries, no? in general, we are following an unsustainable development uh, path or style of development. Uh, I think it could be applied for each every country, even the catch up, catching up Asian countries like China. They have uh, very strong problems, environmental problems, social problems, and uh, I think. Uh, Looking more at the Latin American country, we can say that uh, we have a very strong uh, share of our population that live in poverty. It was told before, and strong social exclusion. We we are, we are talking about transition, so uh, uh, we are strongly dependent on fossil fuels. No? It's very hard to change our economic system. Uh, we have, as it was told before, unsustainable mining practice. Uh, this is applied for every Latin American, African countries. Uh, I think uh, the disaster that happened in Brazil, uh, we have two mega disasters, mining disasters, which show this unsustainability. And uh, we have uh, a predatory land occupation expansion in rural and urban areas. So we have strong problems in urban areas and we have strong problems of deforestation uh, like uh, in other Latin American countries in Brazil and in Africa and Asia also. Uh, so I think uh, it's clear that these countries need to change radically their style of development uh, to make uh, this uh, sustainable transition. And uh, I will say the, the change must happen uh, in, in the, the 
lot of level uh, you, you have to satisfy uh, uh, basic needs we have to prioritize uh, our development to satisfy basic needs so we have uh, as uh, uh, gabriella say half of our population who is uh, having food insecurity we have health education housing uh, problems and in latin america and in developing countries and we need also to build this new infrastructure to, to make the transition. Energy is one of the aspects of this uh, new infrastructure. No? Uh, we have, uh, we need a new transport system. We need to create this uh, uh, ICT's infrastructure. That, and uh, uh, we think uh, this must, uh, we have to change our, our uh, our pathway and, and uh, ECLA né, estimate that if we uh, grow for four percent annual growth in in ten years, we could uh, eradicate poverty in Latin America and uh, also make a transition for uh, new uh, sustainable technologies. He calls they call uh, using the term of uh, Rosenstein Hoda in a big push. So we, we we need to make this big push to make this transition. It, it requires a lot of effort. Huh? Uh, and uh, the science and technology policy must uh, firstly promote these socioeconomic goals, reinforcing also our national system of innovation. Huh? And uh, this transition to sustainability must lean on local technological capability. I think this is a consensus in colleagues. Uh, I, I, I am quite uh, satisfied because uh, we, we are not going to do this transition without uh, good uh, scientific and technological capabilities. Uh, so we have to to stimulate our scientific and technological capability of research and academic system, but also of the productive system of, of firms. And we need also to create the demand for these new technologies no? that will make this transition. No? And, and we know also that uh, we have uh, very, some uh, favorable, favorable uh, uh, natural resource endowments uh, in Latin America. So we, we, we are rich countries, rich resource country, but not every country in the, uh, developing countries are rich resource country, but in Latin America we are. Uh, and uh, we, we must uh, lean on this uh, 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 endowment, local resource endowment, as uh, Julius told before. Now we, we, are, we have to look at our uh, own resource. Huh? Uh, so, uh, in, in this uh, way, we, we try to think about uh, science, technology, and innovative indicators to uh, develop no, uh, th this uh, science and technology policies. No? Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm very sorry to interrupt. It's just that we don't see your slides moving. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let me see if uh, there is a problem. Uh, you, maybe you have to move to the presentation mode. Uh, let me see. I, I'm going to try again. So uh, I, I select the slide. Were you still on your first slide or did you move to another slide? Yeah, this. Uh, I mean, I was also wondering, but so I, I am showing the the first try, line up. Yeah, yeah, but tr try to move to the to the to the presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. So now you are seeing the first slide. Yeah, now it's the first slide, but you are not in the presentation mode. Yeah, so you have to. If I put in. You the go down. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, a little bit down. On there is this. Um, I mean, I don't know because, but uh, can you move? Because now I made you the uh, co-host. Me? No, no, uh, the uh, Andre. Uh, ah, okay. But you should go here. Can you see? No, maybe you don't see my. 
No, I, I am not seeing. Otherwise, you can just advance in this way, but you have to 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 move to from one slide to yeah, the other. I, I think it's better to show this way because. Uh, okay, I, okay, I, doesn't matter. We we can see your screen, so you can. Now, just now you can see it. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. are on the first slide now. Yeah, in first slide. So I'm going to the fourth slide. So yes, fine. I, I was talking about uh, science and technology indicators. No. Uh, we, we need uh, now to to develop the, these indicators, not to monitor policies, to understand what uh, the policy outcomes also, uh, and we, as uh, especially in energy, no? uh, if you are looking for energy transition, no? uh, there is a lack of uh, science and technology innovation indicator of energy sectors in many developing countries. So we are trying to, to deep this gap, no? to fill this gap. No? Uh, and uh, we try to develop no, some indicators here in Brazil. No? So the, it's not an academic initiative, it's a, it's a government initiative. So we are trying to create uh, science and technology indicators for energy sector in order to support science and technology innovation policy for transition. No? And uh, this uh, was an uh, initiative of uh, the EPE, Energy Research Enterprise, uh, which belonged to the Ministry of uh, Mining Energy, of uh, CGE, Strategic Study Management Center for the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation. And we have also the help of ECLA, Economic Commission of Latin America, and the International Energy Agency. And uh, we, we try to develop uh, indicator. The first uh, indicator that we, we try to develop, it was a research and development indicator. The uh, International Energy uh, uh, Agency has al already uh, published uh, the, this indicator for the, the countries that belong to the International Energy Agency. And Brazil is the, one of the first countries that doesn't belong to the uh, International Energy Agency that has uh, created their own uh, indicators on uh, R&D expenditure. So uh, I'm going to show here uh, these indicators, no? uh, as you can see. Uh, and uh, we, we have uh, shows a period of time between 2013, 2018. And it, it's interesting to see how uh, Brazil, for example, make his expenditure on the R&D. No? And uh, we can see uh, related to energy. And we can see that uh, fossil fuel is the main topic. So uh, uh, it, this is related to the importance of oil industry and Petrobras in Brazil. No? And, uh, but uh, the other areas, and we can see that uh, uh, renewables energy is decreasing of importance in Brazil. This, so we have a, a drop, uh, which is possible to see from 2014 to uh, until 2017 and uh, this drop uh, affect more renewables energy than other source of energy uh, investments so uh, uh, we could see that the crisis affect uh, the transition uh, uh, intent of uh, uh, the brazilian economy and uh, uh, here we can see in this is second uh, uh, slide uh, that uh, the importance that has uh, biofuels expenditures on uh, research and development and demonstration that is uh, investments in Brazil. No? And uh, we can see that uh, biofuel was very uh, deeply affected by the crisis no? and uh, renewables energy dec decrease, but uh, uh, the most affected was uh, bioenergy. No? And this is related to the, the, the crisis of the ethanol uh, sugar ethanol sector in Brazil. No? 
So uh, uh, if we want to make a transition, no, uh, I, I think uh, we can see that uh, uh, the one of important advantages, uh, as we saw also in the in the previous uh, presentation, uh, that is ethanol is is decreasing of importance in Brazil. No? Uh, but uh, we, we think uh, that we need uh, also to, to explore uh, other indicators. No? And uh, we, we try to, to conceive uh, many other indicators to, to help. Uh, 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 these indicators, I uh, think, to, to, to study the, the, all the innovation system uh, related to energy, the energy innovation system. So we, we think about uh, uh, human resource, about uh, investments in R and D that I show the infrastructure that is very important. No? the science and technology innovation infrastructure, the cooperation relations between the the actors, uh, the scientific output, the innovation indicator, the supply chain and foreign trade, the policy and regulation, socio political support. All these aspects are important if we want to make a transition. Uh, and we, we intended also to, to develop uh, new indicators in this area. So uh, let me show. We, we have uh, made uh, some intent to measure, for example, in these different areas of uh, technology, uh, that are classified here. This classification is from IEA. No? Uh, where are, uh, what are the position of Brazil in these different areas? No? And uh, we, we, we think, you know, for example, that, that this uh, Brazil is not uh, participating very much in the expansion of patents uh, worldwide, no? uh, like, uh, for example, China is a leading actor in this area. But uh, we, we can see uh, that, uh, for example, in, in biofuels, no, the stronger position of Brazil, but uh, in other areas, for, for example, we told about hydrogen. We, you can see that hydrogen is more or less nothing in Brazil. No? Uh, so th these new opportunities that are being uh, talk uh, of fuel cells, for example, was very weak, you know, the, the, or energy storage, for example, is very weak. So uh, I think uh, we can see more or less what are the strengths and the, the weakness of our science and technology innovation systems. We have also tried to develop human resource indicators. Uh, unfortunately, this is not in, in uh, English, but uh, we, we try to measure the people occupy in science and technology activities in, in, the, in the energy sector. And we, we could see, for example, that 7% uh, of the people occupied in the science technology activities in the productive sector in Brazil belongs to the energy sector. So the energy sector is very important in the Brazilian economy. So, and uh, it's, a, it's a very imp important strength of uh, our economy. So we, we need to, uh, try to put this energy sector in the right direction of the transition. Uh, uh, last uh, slide about indicators, we are trying to measure also the economic relevance. What is the, the length of uh, the energy sector in our economy, employment, uh, in, in the industry, the manufacturing mining. So we, we can see that the total energy sector has, for example, 9% of the employment, but 25% uh, of the value added. So it's, it's a very important sector in the Brazilian economy. Well, uh, like final remarks, I would say that uh, uh, science technology indicators are very important to support uh, policy for energy transition. Uh, many of uh, these uh, indicators must be created. They are not already uh, uh, 
I, I think uh, the, we have uh, tried to create this uh, research and development. We are trying to create no, new indicators. Uh, uh, this indicator already showed um, important phenomenon for the Brazil, for example, that the, the great uh, fall of investment in re renewables energy since uh, 2014. The 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 importance of biofuel science and technology capabilities for Brazil, no? and uh, and also the the importance of energy sector for uh, science and technology, human resource, employment, and for the economy. So we we could see that uh, this uh, great importance of uh, our uh, indicators for uh, to understand better our uh, energy innovation system. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I will uh, now move immediately to the first discussant, Amir. Everyone. Please. Uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's a real pleasure to participate. And first I echo the words that, uh, from many of you that Globlix has been a wonderful community. The first time I joined was because there was a conference in Cuba I uh, thought any group that does a conference in Cuba, you know, sounds like a great group, but I would, I would have never imagined that this would open my intellectual horizon uh, in this way. Um, Andre, thanks for your presentation. It was uh, extremely interesting, uh, along with the rest of the workshop. Uh, perhaps I have um, three main comments uh, to do. Um, the first one that you know, the case of Brazil is extremely interesting, uh, especially looking at what has happened historically uh, and the biofuels uh, sector in particular. Uh, and the comment I had was about the directionality of the low carbon R&D, you know, in relation to discussion that was stimulated earlier by Annabelle and, and others. And the question here is really about the directionality within low carbon R&D. Uh, and the main question being, do we live in a world right now where just doing low carbon R&D is not even enough anymore, right? Where each country needs to find specific areas of competitive advantage, both areas where you can compete, right? Uh, I think Rasmus mentioned that it's extremely difficult to compete with China for many types of low carbon technologies. And the case of Brazil is interesting in this way because it's not just any type of R&D, it's especially on biofuels kind of, you know, with linkages to the domestic, uh, sugarcane sector and so on. So, and that's a question to you, but also to many of you as well, especially in the context of other developing countries, right? What kind of, you know, uh, sustainable R&D uh, should be promoted? Um, not everybody obviously can do the same and it can have a huge opportunity cost, right? Two um, is the context of Brazil, which is very interesting, but also quite exceptional, right? Even within Latin America, you know, over 90% of the R&D in renewable energy is in Brazil, right? Uh, so along with, you know, China and other countries, those and India, I mean, those are countries that are often mentioned in the context of, of green industrialization, green industrial policy, but they're huge, right? With a very large domestic market size. Um, and to what extent, you know, in countries that are much smaller, you know, these experiences can be replicated and including the role of innovation, right? Um, and, uh, um, and that also links to uh, industrial policy tools. To go back to the policy tools and methods part of, of, of this panel, uh, this links as well with demand side policies, which I think so far in the past decade, most kind of green industrial policies have been attached with very important demand side policy in China, now in the US uh, and other places, and, and, and Brazil, right, with renewable energy uh, plants. So, and you can only do it, you know, combine it with innovation if you have a large domestic market size. But if you're Peru, Rwanda, Gabon, basically, what, what do you do? And I know it's not the purpose of your presentation, but I, uh, I think Brazil's case is very informative. So I wanted to push you to kind of tell us about uh, how to uh, translate those challenges in other geographies. Um, and uh, lastly, the point I wanted to uh, add is about kind of supranational 
uh, coordination with uh, innovation, right? As part of kind of addressing different types of challenges, how do you see Brazil being, again, exceptional because of its large size, but how do you see kind of prospects for countries, developed countries coming to the special level set to pull together resources for innovation, especially around low carbon sectors and address kind of joint challenges and, and sharing uh, spillovers. But thank you again, uh, Andre. It was fascinating and look forward to the discussion. Okay, so uh, thank you so much. And now I can uh, give the floor to Corey as uh, this is the second uh, discussion. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Rabata. Uh, I must thank uh, Andre for a thoughtful presentation and uh, his uh, thought over the policy methods and indicators. Uh, but before I go straight to uh, my points and my, the questions that I raised, I would like to just do a little recap from the paper that he was able to bring out. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay, okay. Now he was able to bring about the, 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 the pursuit of sustainable development and uh, uh, low carbon uh, economic system by trying to bring in uh, technologies adaptation from uh, developed countries. He also looked at uh, pollutions that are being brought from uh, the burning of uh, fossil fuel as a point. And he, he talked about migration of people from uh, rural to urban areas where uh, such movement can create pollution as well and greenhouse uh, uh, effects. He, he looked at the mining of natural resources uh, to another. And um, he encouraged the countries within the global south to be more practicable in a circular economy by reestablishing economic dynamics uh, and job creations. I looked at STI policy within the confirm of uh, the Brazil contest, and uh, I looked at social to be uh, to to also encourage the inclusivity of uh, 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 indigenous uh, technologies that are there. Um, another thing he also see, saw is that uh, that STI indicators. Uh, are a necessity to monitor capabilities of uh, the national innovative system in transiting to uh, uh, in the energy transition process. Um, I am going to talk more from the African context because uh, what he looked at was more of uh, Latin America because Africa is a big market for uh, uh, green technologies as it's done in uh, especially with solar. Um, uh, uh, what context, when you build your policies and you look at what uh, people are driving at, uh, our current uh, president-elect was asked in London in one of the interviews, and uh, he mentioned that uh, why should uh, Nigeria, where I'm from, be paying for carbon credits? How much pollution have we caused? Because in the uh, uh, COP27 meeting that was held recently in, uh, I think in, in November uh, in, in Egypt, we're able to see that Africa only contribute 4% of the total global emission. And this, and, and yet the most diversely, diversely, uh, diversely impacted uh, region. This according to the, uh, uh, the chair of Africa group that is negotiating in that meeting. Uh, we are asked to pay for carbon uh, credits, but while these pollutions are being done, the processes of policy today is such that we, the Africans or the, 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 the South, cannot catch up easily uh, without polluting. So this, this aspect of policy where policy should be directed towards and looking at what and what that is necessary. Then we also looked at uh, the policy method adopted and deployed in the global south. As to be de debated and dictated by the global north, these policies are seen often as a, a, a kind of tie to resilience 
we will be the ones that are following up while the knot is leading. And it, it, it appears to be non-inclusive, uh, it, it has to be non-inclusivity from the start. For example, the payment of carbon, this, uh, this carbon credit we are talking about, while the Paris Agreement was being discussed at the point, the, this, the, 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 the people from the, the global South were only tabled with some of these, uh, 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 I would like to call it uh, in the, um, uh, variables that consigns them afterwards to come and negotiate at the point. These are challenges with policies that we have been able to develop over the years that manages uh, energy transition and uh, what follows. The issue of natural resources exploitation and exploration in the global south is made complicated by actors, foreign partners, those who are involved in the policy process. They complicate this process. Uh, uh, it's a very sad one since uh, 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 the last 24 hours, if I may tell you, a happening in Nigeria where 15 people were reported uh, uh, that were burnt from uh, illegal refining of uh, uh, crude. The system in Nigeria, where, where Aramco is reporting that they are using AI in their technologies to run their uh, hydrocarbon facilities, those exploring in Nigeria, in Nigeria have been, have been unable to tell us how much crude over the years, for nearly 60 years, or more than 60 years, they have been exploring crude oil in Nigeria. They have, been able to, they have not been able to tell us about how much crude they generate daily and how much is being sold. So it, it now becomes a resource cost. It, it appears to be a resource cost. So the diffusion of even technology by, this, by, by, by the north to the south is, is somehow downplayed. The technologies that are deployed for mining, it's, it's, also, it's also taking that pattern over and over again within the southern, uh, uh, the global south. The case of lithium oil that was discovered recently in Nigeria, which is a, a, a major component of renewable energies. When we talk about solar energy, for example, or you power the, the, the electricity, uh, uh, electric vehicles. These have been brought before uh, 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 foreign firms who showed interest. One particular, is, it's, it's well known, they showed interest, but they are very unwilling to transfer technologies here to optimize part of these uh, uh, natural resources, which will stimulate uh, the policy process. They, they, they decided to say, let's take the raw material, which is the usual pattern within the African context, and take over to the north. And then you take out, you process the entire thing, and then use it for uh, the purposes of uh, uh, producing such lithium uh, uh, batteries, which will power things that are also to be used within the, Niger within the, uh, the south here. So for the case of Nigeria that I'm bringing up, the government said, look, in our policy document or our policy framework, we want you to optimize some of these uh, 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 minerals here and then process them. Then you can take maybe part of it or to, to finish up over there in uh, the north. But this is a, a problem. The history of, uh, of exploration of uh, hydrocarbon followed the same uh, path in most countries in the south across Africa, even to, to Asia. These and other issues have brought a disconnect between policy and practice in the global South. Where policy are designed, they are written down clearly with strategies to, uh, to, to achieve them. These things are not clearly obtainable at the long run. Then when you talk about what are the new metrics and methods, that are necessary for effective policy implementation in the global south. Countries should be able to pursue policies that measure periodic pollution level, waste production, global warming, water emissions, and level of water usage. We should be able to also look at indicators of innovations that are more focused on science discovery, rate of patent, like uh, uh, Andre said, 
the rate of businesses created, these are very necessary. I think uh, uh, if uh, Caleb, Caleb is here, Dr. Caleb may be able to say something about the patent filed in these areas within Nigeria context and uh, much of Africa. Then we also look at another point I also uh, I brought up uh, to just before I round up is what, uh, what kind of policy approach can be researched and explored in the community to improve policy implementation. Emphasis on policy framework for environmental policy in the global south should include components like environmental performance report and mining, as well as other activity. Environmental justice assessment should be done periodically. Rasmus also mentioned this the other time. The case between a community in the river state in Nigeria and one of the multinationals that was decided in London last year, it was concluded, or last two years, we are yet, the people of the Ogoni community are yet to see that the environmental justice is done after assessment be within them. And then those, even the government people that have come to look at what has been done. So much has not been achieved in that area. So policies should be focused towards this direction. The environmental impact assessment and environmental audit and some other areas we can really uh, work much more on. And then finally, how can our research be relevant for policymakers? How? The policy advocacy and diplomacy that would further develop a fair, equitable, effective, and ambiguous multilateral framework for sustainability should be pursued in our policy documents. Also, stakeholders, those who are involved from the grassroots to the final person, even the user, the end user, should, when, um, um, should be sensitized on issues that are surrounding policies, such policies, environmental policies and innovations, then they are, should be included and they should participate in the whole process. So I'll leave it for you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much <clears throat> for, for both uh, intervention. I think now we have about 10 minutes for uh, questions. And uh, then maybe the, the three speakers uh, will have a few minutes uh, just to uh, react. Please. Any question? I don't see. Uh, sorry. Uh, I don't see if there are questions. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Michiko, please. Yes, um, I have a question. Thank you very much, Andre, for a very interesting kind of indicator shown in that uh, slides. And then also, I'm kind of taking over, taking from the um, earlier discussion that we have made. Um, I think your uh, indicators are very much in the domains of science and technology innovation, looking into the R&D, looking into the um, uh, patents, looking into the human resources, which I think is very good to initiate. But uh, um, there were also other issues that were being discussed, which concerns more on the sustainability issues, but may not be, uh, that the indicator may not be available at the moment, within the domain of science and technology innovation. And I was wondering what sort of kind of consideration has been discussed in, in, the, in, in Brazil or in the other Latin American countries uh, when, on this subject. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michika. I have now uh, Emmanuel and then Reiner and then, uh, uh, I don't know. Well, let, let's start with Emmanuel, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I do want to know, because uh, I have not gotten that clearly, how science, technology, and innovation indicators could be used to monitor and evaluate sust sustainability. Because um, just like we've seen, the SDG goals have been somehow um, uh, domesticated in countries. So countries are to um, have their own agenda and then monitor and evaluate 
get indicators they should use. So um, how can we actually use um, STI indicators to measure um, the level of achievement of uh, um, the SDGs or sustainability as, as it is? Thank you. Thanks, Rainer. The floor is yours. Yes, thank, thank you, Mel. Quick, quick comment to, to the uh, previous research where there's a lot of, of indicator systems uh, also on, on sustainability impact. So, so clearly we have to link up to that. But my, my question is, is a little bit in, in our direction. We, we had the debate about how, how to open up research uh, more uh, towards application. And clearly, if I look at the, at the SDI uh, indicators, that, that is, is an area where, where I would suppose that there is some interest of, of uh, also policymakers uh, to figure out where are we in, in my country. Uh, and now, now a question to uh, to you, uh, André, but also perhaps a question to all of us. Isn't it necessary in, in doing that kind of research uh, that, that we talk uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to the uh, interesting communities what they want to know? For example, in Brazil, as a steel producer number nine in the world, is, is there a need to also look at STI indicators with regard to green steel making, uh, for example, which, which is a very hot topic. For, for all of us, the question, how, how, how are we going to proceed? Should we much more look into uh, building workshops with, with community, with policymakers, with NGOs, with companies within our research? Wouldn't that be a, a way to figure out what they are interested in, how we can frame our our results, also that it's much more easier uh, uh, to uh, of that research being uptaken. And also, we had in in the chat a little bit uh, a debate. Wouldn't that it also make it much more easy for us uh, uh, to to also transfer our research uh, in, in into other uh, policy relevant debates? So, so for me, looking at methodologies that also involves a mode of research and perhaps what, what I call uh, a, a transdisciplinary approach uh, to include more uh, of, of the uh, people interested in application into research. Interesting perhaps to have also your views on that. Thank you, Reiner. And now I have on my screen a Kingsley, please. The floor is yours. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to thank the presenter, the professor, on the way he presented his his own talk, I want to ask a question. He talked so much on policy method, and also talked about indicators with respect to science, technology, and innovation. I know very much that there are also some indicators, such like social indicators, economic indicators, and above all biophysical indicators. This one is very, very paramount in the environmental sustainability and innovation. Does it mean that in Brazil, they don't put much emphasis on biophysical indicators? Thank you. Thanks, Annabelle, please. Hi, thank you, yeah. Now, just a brief comment in relation um, to the one comment made by Amir. In, in relation to the directionality within this, some of these sectors, which I think is very interesting because uh, um, there are a lot of tensions at the moment, uh, from what I know, in the development, implementation and development of some of these uh, green sectors in South America that are creating conflicts because you are addressing some uh, environmental um, sustainability challenges, but you're creating new ones. So for example, I don't know, in mining, by, for example, introducing new technologies that um, desalinate water. So they solve the problem of using fresh water, but then they throw uh, waste in the sea back again, and they're creating problems in the coast. So there are kind of um, many, many questions about um, uh, issues that have to do with directionality within sectors. and are not related only um, to the hard technologies that will be used, but also the way in which decisions are taken and who wins and who, do, who lose and so on. So I think that this is a very important topic and just 
if you mentioned that. Yes, yes, uh, I, I agree. And I would add to, to this comment that uh, uh, we need to account about uh, uh, the trade-off in terms of environmental outcomes, but also possible trade-off in terms of social uh, social uh, impact. Because uh, as I was saying in my intervention, and this was referring not really to, to a developing country, but to something is happening in Norway and, in, uh, and also in, in Sweden uh, with this new mine, which was op uh, in, on, on rare off just open in the north of Sweden, uh, a lot of tension uh, started to, to, to to, um, uh, to to be created with the Sami community. So, I mean, this is something also we need to, to account. Okay, I think, uh, I mean, uh, no, no, I don't think there are more uh, uh, intervention. And so I think- uh, There's one more raised hand, Roberta. Uh, uh, yes, but K Kingsley, I, I don't know if it's for, because he, uh, he, he just uh, uh, made an intervention. So Kingsley, would you like to intervene again or it was from before? So no, maybe it was from before. Okay, so um, so I think I I will uh, give the floor back uh, to Andre and then to the two discussant and then maybe to Michiko to conclude uh, uh, the, the the I mean to, to conclude the workshop. So please, Andre, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the comments. They are very rich. And I, I don't think I could answer to all of them. I think you are raising very wide questions. So uh, uh, first about Amir, I, I would say that uh, certainly Brazil is uh, a country that have uh, a great expenditure on R and D, uh, but I think uh, our position is not very different from the other developing countries because we are very dependent from imported technology in much much of the field. So uh, we we need also to choose and to have a strategy. So uh, and uh, in Brazil uh, sometimes uh, one of the lessons that we can take about Brazil uh, that uh, we we cannot choose. We, we have very great difficulty to choose what are our uh, specialization. Uh, so uh, uh, I think uh, we, we need to, to improve uh, uh, our capability to understand what are our weakness and what are our strengths uh, for the, the... And you, you, you uh, told also about uh, coordination and uh, cooperation. I think it's an important question. Brazil have made some intents to make cooperation with Africa. I, I don't think they are very successful. Uh, I think we, we need to, to improve much more this uh, kind of cooperation. In Latin America, we don't have very much cooperation uh, uh, done by governments. And, and, and I think we need to, to improve this cooperation in, in fields like uh, uh, renewables, we could improve much more uh, our cooperation. Uh, uh, Johnson uh, uh, raised the question of Africa. I think uh, uh, Latin America and Africa have a very common problems like uh, mining, deforestation, uh, poverty. Uh, they, they have different scales, in, in our, but we have the common problems. And uh, I think uh, th this problem, as I as I told in my presentation, they need to, to be addressed by general policy, not only by science and technological policy. The, the science technology policy would not solve all the questions. And uh, we have to have a social policy, economic policy, uh, social policy to reduce the inequality, to satisfy uh, big needs, and we have to have a economic policy to increase labor, formal labor. Without that, we wouldn't reach any result of a good transition. So, uh, and uh, transition is 
only one of the, the ways to get there. No? But uh, the main problem is that to address is our undevelopment. Uh, and uh, Michiko also uh, asked for other indicators. I, I completely agree. We, we are trying to move. So, but we are looking for the science and technology innovation system. Uh, so we are much in this, uh, not uh, so, uh, but the system of innovation needs more indicators. This classical indicator are not enough. Uh, completely agree, and uh, trying to 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 uh, address the other question raised by uh, Emmanuel uh, uh, and uh, Rainer, for example, I think uh, uh, the others indicators like environmental indicators are very important. I, I, I but I didn't uh, address this question. So say we need also these indicators to understand uh, uh, how. Uh, the sector are contributing for emission or how we can reduce this emission for, like uh, in uh, steel industry as you told me uh, in other sectors uh, uh, we, we need to, to ask this and, and uh, Nagoma also uh, told about uh, a social and economic indicator we, we are trying in some way, but related to science and technology. We, there's not other indicators. So for example, for impact of this uh, activity, I think one of the questions raised by Roberta is that, uh, what, uh, what is the impact uh, if we choose these uh, technologies? So we, we need to, to, to address also this kind of indicator. So I, I will finish there because I, I, out, I am out of time, but I thank you very much much for all your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, uh, Okari, would you like to add something to the debate? Yes, um, I, I, I would like to just uh, uh, respond a little to, uh, I think, uh, the question from uh, Ajim is the Manuel, who happened to be uh, from the same uh, country with me or in different locations. Um, the happenings that I mentioned during my uh, discussion, um, it has to do with uh, the deforestation first, the degradation of the forest, the uh, loss of life, the vehicles. The, when you see the pictures that were displayed on national television, since this morning, they are very awful. It's something that one weeps about. Why? Because this question has to do with how can STI indicators be used and uh, used to and uh, used and to monitor sustainable uh, sustainability. If these indicators capture the things of the rate of businesses in that area, in environmental sustainability, environmental policies we can develop, this is an opportunity based on things like this, to develop uh, uh, indicators that could stop our problems. I will leave it there. I think most of all the other questions have been taken care of. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the globalist community for bringing this together and uh, bringing these ideas and then we'll go back and discuss some of them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, Amir, it's your uh, turn, please. Uh, thank you very much for this discussion. It's a lot of food for thought for you know next uh, conferences and workshops. So just reacting to some of the few points. Uh, one important one is you know the idea that sustainability is indeed dynamic across time and space, right? Especially when it comes to water use. Some technologies might have might lower carbon footprint, but if they use so much water, right, in water scarce areas. This is not sustainability, right? Um, and that links to Rasigan's point earlier today about looking at the broader picture of sustainability. And it's true that there has been an obsessive emphasis on carbon footprint, but that often um, at the expense of other types of ecological goals, like reducing our material footprint and biodiversity loss, which at times can be contradictory, right? Or can be uh, mutually exclusive. And you see it, for example, with hydropower dams. So in that context, there's links again to the directionality and picking the challenge, right, in each country, what it actually means, sustainable innovation, 
uh, and what are the assets that can be part of it? Uh, and for example, using natural resources, right? Like biofuels in Brazil and other parts. And that links to Carlota's, uh, Carlota Perez's work and Annabelle as well on using natural resources as a level, level, lever for technological upgrading and innovation. And some people, Johnson mentioned uh, lithium in Nigeria and Zimbabwe and other places. I mean, these are the kind of places where it's really thinking about what you have and how that pushes, how that gives a direction for your STI policies. And that process is obviously extremely political, but so far developing countries seem to be trapped, right? In a way that the direction of global innovation uh, around low carbon technologies, uh, they're not only see controlling where it's going, right? It's going to be nuclear fission, hydrogen, uh, you know, other things. It's, uh, it's obviously different countries have an interest in it and, and through government tools can shape the direction of those. Um, but thinking about kind of how that links to specific, specific policies in developing countries is quite interesting. And lastly, maybe a put for thought for next time is to what extent um, technological foresight capabilities matter a lot more for low carbon um, innovation policies than for standard innovation. Because again, we don't know which technology is emerging. It's all you know, uh, there's so much disruption, even within the same technology for solar panels, for example. So how does that feed back into the whole literature on national innovation ecosystems and, and, and developing countries attempting to enter that space? Thank you very much. And again, look forward to keep discussing those with you in the next few years. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Amir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to all the speakers, the discussant and uh, I mean, uh, everybody was uh, here for uh, this long uh, workshop. Uh, uh, it's Saturday afternoon, at least here, <laughs> and it's sunny. So I think we need uh, sometimes to to enjoy uh, the, 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 the rest of the afternoon. But I want uh, to 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 give the floor to Michiko to conclude. Thank you so much for organizing uh, this workshop. Thank you very much for being here for such a long hour, and I cannot agree more with, with uh, Roberta. Um, and I don't want to uh, kind of prolong your stay here on the on the online session, but I do believe that we had covered a uh, vast uh, areas of the sustainable issues, and the starting from the you know the starting point of the two thousand three two thousand three uh, two thousand two. Uh, um, when we are talking about catching up and then catching up and then the uh, the, the sort of sustainability is coming as uh, one way of um, dealing with the, um, the growth. But then now I think the issues are much, much broader. We are talking about political economy. We are, uh, we are kind of in the second session, we were talking about kind of discourse. Oh, no, no, sorry. The first session, we we're talking about how to understand uh, coming from what we know to um, the, the the issue that we have to be taking into. So it's like coming from the inside to the outside, uh, listing out all this discourse, all these um, uh, issues that needs to be taken care of. And then the second is the other way around. We are now narrowing the scope to the globe, a green uh, window of opportunity, but then also expanding the issues that needs to be dealt with, which are uh, 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 looking into uh, food sustainability and how we're going to incorporate the regional perspective. So um, I, I find, and then the, the third session, we looked at the indicators, policy and method, and then we did um, look at the, uh, a very good presentation with Andre, uh, um, how to apply the uh, existing science and technology indicator into this area, but we also see the uh, quite uh, shortcomings in how to deal with this issue. And I think that's uh, quite a lot of challenge ahead of uh, ahead of us. So I think um, uh, we, we did a, a, a very uh, good work, thanks to you all, uh, in identifying what needs to be done uh, and then I hope that uh, we would be able to exchange our views in this forum because that, uh, it was very, um, I think, uh, rewarding for me to get the, the, the views from very different context. I would not know much about the, the, the Brazilian context, or whether, and then I would not know whether the, the South African context in how the sustainability issue a really a big agenda to be dealt with. So, I mean, having this kind of insight would probably be very helpful in uh, connecting the reality 
what we have um, to the, the more theoretical uh, contribution that we also have to do as a community of academic uh, uh, researchers uh, in uh, uh, development and innovation. But in any case, um, I know that this is a long, uh, uh, and then this is also at Saturday. So I very much thank for uh, your participation and thank you very much for organize uh, or the other um, um, uh, people who had been in part of organizing this workshop. And uh, this is uh, all for you. And then I hope you have a very nice uh, rest of the weekend. Thank you.